If you're paying attention to what's going on at Steelers training camp, you're probably liking what you're hearing and seeing from Broderick Jones. We'll break down exactly what we're seeing and why I think it's trending towards him actually earning the starting spot at left tackle sooner rather than later. That and a lot more here on the Locked on Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter. Let's get into it. You are Locked on Steelers, your daily Pittsburgh Steelers podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter, bringing you daily dose of all things the Pittsburgh Steelers. As always, you can find this show on your favorite podcasting apps and on YouTube. Like this video if you enjoy it. Subscribe to this YouTube channel to get all of your daily Monday through Friday episodes, as well as our bonus content. We thank you for making the Locked On Steelers podcast your first listen every day because we're your team every day. And like I said before, we're going to focus on Broderick Jones a little bit and Dan, Dan Moore Jr. Now, of course, as I said, coming into this season, this was or coming into this training camp, excuse me. Um, we knew what the deal was. Dan Moore Jr. was going to start out as the starting left tackle, and then Broderick Jones was probably going to be on the second team, and then eventually Broderick Jones would be going to be given some first team reps, and then whether or not he would be the starting tackle by the start of the season, that would be determined over time. And oh, and it would take a process of him having to win the job over, and then winning the job for him might even just mean being kind of as good as Dan Moore Jr., but we've also had people on the show who thought that might be a taller task than what we might realize. Jim Wexel, who writes for 24-7 Sports, he came on here and he gave his honest opinion. He's like, he thought that Dan Moore Jr. was going to hold on to the spot. Um, and we've had differing opinions all over the place. But now that the pads are on, we're starting to see where both uh, Broderick Jones and Dan Moore Jr. are. Now, I'm here to say before I we start this conversation so that no one misunderstands what I'm representing with my with my take here. I am not saying that Broderick Jones has already won the left tackle position. Dan Moore Jr. still gets that. But we needed to see certain things from Broderick Jones. And so far, we're seeing those things. One, we needed to see when the pads weren't on. Could he just kind of make sure he was getting into the right spots, understanding things when he was in pass protection? Would he understand when they were sending different blitzers from different angles at him? And he certainly seemed like that was the case. He wasn't getting lost in the sauce. He was communicating. He was understanding to protect his inside gap and then understanding when when you know, when, when he checked that and how, when to kind of bounce outside and take care of other edge rushers. He seems to be doing the mental parts right. But we wanted to see how good has how how much his athleticism would translate once the pant with the once the pads gone on and how he could win against opponents and how he could win in those situations but we, then we also wanted to see how he'd respond when he lost different reps and if he could if he could counter what opponents were doing because a big part of the best offensive tackles in the game, especially in pass protection, you can have a style of, of, of protection that really works for you. You can look for certain things, but the whole point of great edge rushers, like we see with the Steelers, TJ Watt, Alex Highsmith, and what they like to do is that you have a wide variety of approaches. And so the best offense, offensive tackles need to be able to respond to the, to that, to that variety. They need to be able to respond to different ways of attack and hold, hold their own ground while without uh, being too confused by different pass rush moves that get used against them. And so far, I think we're seeing that from Broderick Jones. Now, on day one in pads, he looked really strong, both in run both in run blocking and pass blocking. He seemed like he was fitting right in, and that was a good sign. But we needed to see how he would do when he started to lose a few more of those reps. And that because, like I said, that was going to determine, okay, if he lost to this style or this type of move or this type of player – then is what's going to determine his progress and where he really is that they're working from is going to be how he responded in that and how he was able to change, adjust to that, if he was able to adjust to that. And we kind of saw that uh, on day two of pads on Wednesday. And the kind of, it kind of went on with a with a one on one drill that he had with Marcus Golden, where Golden eventually they went to, they went up against each other three times. The first two times, Golden wins, and it was kind of I think the first time that Broderick Jones was getting a little humbled in camp, but that humbleness didn't lead to him kind of putting his head down or anything. He stuck with it in his final rep. He adjusted, wins the rep. And he earns praise from even defensive coaches who who were watching, which to me 
that's a really good sign that he's going to be able to be there. Now, Mike Tomlin after practice did say, you know, like, like, Hey, he's, he's right where he needs to be. He won't, you know, Mike Tomlin, he's never going to give guys too much praise uh, in the press, you know, when it comes to that. But I think you're seeing Broderick Jones be having a very high ceiling for what, or excuse me. uh, We know he has a high ceiling, a very high floor coming into training camp. I think you're seeing that this guy, he's on a different level and, this is the impact of picking a player in the first round for your offensive line and uh, and, and getting the right player because there's plenty of offensive linemen that do get picked in the first round that still aren't that good. Uh, but Broderick Jones, this was the stuff that we were excited to see and we were wondering about, could he do these types of things when we were looking at his tape in Georgia? The tape in Georgia showed he could be a very athletic lineman who could be very physically dominant, who once he gets his hands on you, it was over. But the question was going to be, how can he how would he handle against other pass rushers who have different styles, who force him to kind of come out of his comfort zone a little bit because he only played eight, not played 19 games in college so far, at least in just the first two days of pads and training camp. He looks like he's excuse me, making that adjustment to, to in, in his game. And I think that's important. And on the flip side, Dan Moore, Jr., I, I think he's still kind of who he is. He He's not bad. He's kind of in position. But uh, he I think he, he went up three times against Alex Highsmith and lost all three times. And not that Alex Highsmith is every pass rusher, but if Dan Moore Jr. is going to hold on to this job to start the season, he's got to show that he – I think that he, he has to show that he's significantly, significantly better, not just moderately better not or marginally better, but he has to show that, hey, like – if you keep me in there, Kenny Pickett is going to be in a much better sp- spot as far as protection wise, and he, you're going to open up. I want to be able to help mo- open up much bigger holes for Najee Harris and Jalen Warren in the in the run game. And I think Dan Work Jr. can be part of that, but truly with Isaac Samalo, who by the way, Broderick Jones, you know, to, was telling us was, was telling the at the media that you know Isaac Samalo is his roommate. He room he rooms with Samalo and the Herbig brothers. Uh, and he says he really enjoys that. But you have Siamala who's going to play next to Broderick Jones when he does get the starting spot. You have um, and, and you have Broderick Jones kind of fitting in with this group, uh, understanding those challenges. And the way that, again, I, I wanted to see how he responded to, you know, not being, uh, you know, not being able to win all the time. And so far, he's responding pretty well. It goes back to what we were saying about this draft class. The Steelers didn't just get talented guys. They got guys who fit the locker room vibe that they're going for as far as humble but confident uh, you know, players who can develop into leaders uh, behind the leaders that they already have on the roster. Broderick Jones, I have no idea if he'll be a leader at some point, but right now, He's right where you want him to be if you're if you're a person who wants him to be able to start by the start of the season. So we'll keep updating you on that with how things look in training camp. Remember, there's practice Thursday, and then we get the Friday Night Lights practice Friday. Uh, so it's going still a lot to go on here and a lot of excitement to cover. I want to talk about something about Kenny Pickett and the type of uh, a specific throw that I see him keep executing that I think is a really good sign of where he is going and where the offense is going. We'll talk about that here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter. But first, I want to talk to you guys more about one of our great sponsors, and that's LinkedIn. LinkedIn, of course, is the uh, is the awesome network that allows that allows people to go find new jobs. But if you're one of those people, one of those people that runs one of those those new those small businesses and you need new hires, LinkedIn is also the perfect place for you to find those job candidates. You can create a free job and po- job post in minutes on LinkedIn jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. Then just add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to, to your LinkedIn profile, and that'll spread the word that you're hiring so your network can help you find the right people to hire. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know every week nearly 40 million job seekers seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for, for free. Terms and conditions apply.
Back here on the Locked On Steelers podcast, I'm your host, Chris Carter. We're continuing our talk about what we're seeing here in training camp. One thing that Kenny Pickett had a, a bit in college and displayed a little bit last year that I've seen a lot more in this training camp is his back shoulder throw. It's, you know, for those who, who aren't familiar, it's usually when a quarterback throws the ball down the sideline to a receiver who uh, is pinned to the sideline by a cornerback and the cornerback, you know, usually the cornerback or whoever's guarding them, they're in, they're, they're more to the inside. They're trying to st- make sure that you can't get behind them. They're trying to make sure that you don't, they don't give up the touchdown, but the, 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 the sneaky part. So like if you're, if I was running forward here and the cornerback was trying to stop me from going forward, the back shoulder, of course, will be the side closest to the sideline where I kind of stop, turn and catch it, catch it on my back shoulder, which is very hard to defend because it's also impossible. Almost, it's almost impossible to react to unless you're expecting it. And the tricky part about great back shoulder throwers, Aaron Rodgers being one of the best of them that I've ever seen, is that when you're able to do it at so many different parts of the field, like it's not programmed that it's just always 10 yards or always 15 yards. It makes it so that you can never guess when it's coming. Or if you take that guess and you guess right that one time, it's like hitting the lottery. But if you guess wrong, you then give up the big play because then you stopped, jumped a pass that's not coming, and now this guy is running down the sideline and and is probably going to score a touchdown. It's one of those things that if you're a quarterback and you can hit that consistently, it is a major weapon in your arsenal. And I I don't think it's – uh, I don't think it's a completely consistent yet for Kenny Pickett, but it's getting there. And there were times, if you go back last year, there were times he was able to hit it with different receivers, um, but it wasn't something that was a regular part of the arsenal. And in training camp, it's becoming more regular. And not just for George Pickens or Deontay Johnson, who, by the way, Deontay, George, we talked about George Pickens and how he's been styling out in camp. Deontay Johnson's also having a really good, good camp. He's showing how great of a route runner he is. He made a really impressive catch uh, yesterday on Wednesday's practice. But he's not just doing it with those guys. He's also doing it with Allen Robinson, the veteran. He's also doing it with guys like Connor Hayward and Najee Harris. There's a really good wheel route that Najee Harris had, and he hit him on the back shoulder when he was being covered by Cole Holcomb, who, by the way, was actually really good in coverage there. He kind of he put he kept himself between Pickett and Harris, pinned him to the sideline, but – Harris was able to get the catch and 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 make a big play there and be, and Kenny Pickett put it on the money. And the thing is about those back shoulder throws, not only is it tough for defenders to plan for them, it's also like a sign that like this guy is extremely accurate and he, when he's fitting the ball in wherever he wants like that, that's one of the most scariest things that you can face as a defense. Um and, and if Steelers fans, you should know because Tom Brady, that's how he operated. Tom Brady didn't have the strongest arm. He wasn't the biggest. He wasn't the fastest. He just picked you apart because he knew where you were going to be before you were there. Now, some will say there's reasons for that, and there were such suspensions that were levied out for that, but that's not the point that I'm getting at here. What Tom Brady did that was so great was he was the best field, he was the best surveyor of the field that I've ever seen in football is that he could see the field, and he was just extremely accurate. I don't know if he's the most accurate quarterback ever. Uh, that's that's a debate for another day, but I, he's, he's up there. But Kenny Pickett, where if I've thought that he could get to be was if his accuracy get to a high point, I think he's a guy who can see the field very well. He studies a lot of film. We've talked about, about how he's obsessed with film on uh, when we talked about it on the show. He has an office where he works on that, specifically in the Steelers facility. I, I think Kenny Pickett's working his way to getting there. And we when we look at the back shoulder throw as being part of it and seeing it there, sometimes it's just organic. Sometimes it's just, hey, I know where with this guy that I'm working at that we that if if things are breaking down, they know to to, to look for the ball on the back shoulder at this hash or at this point of this point of the field or however many steps that that, that they've gone forward there. Um, but the fact that he's building that with several different guys. Can be a will could be a really frustrating point for opponents trying to stop him uh, moving forward because again if, if you're thinking that you've got everything else locked down and all of a sudden the receiver just stops and and they hit the and the back shoulder throw comes uh, it's gonna it's gonna it's those are the kind of things that frustrate corners and get them to make mistakes and give you bigger openings um, I think that's a huge thing there and again the fact that he's doing with with different players at different positions. I think it's a really good sign. And again, with the accuracy being there, that's what the Steelers want in their franchise quarterback. I tell you this right now, and this is why I have been 
hyped on the Kenny Pickett hype train for quite some time. I see a path for this man to not just become a franchise quarterback, but to someday be an elite quarterback. I'm not saying that's going to happen right now, but I am going to, but I am saying that if this man continues to grow in how he sees the field, his accuracy gets sharper. He develops better connections with guys. Kenny Pickett is the kind of leader you want on your team. I've seen that in college. I've talked about my time covering Kenny Pickett a lot on this show, but if he has the accuracy and he has the field vision he already has the leadership components. I think it puts him right in that conversation with what Steelers want him to be, and that's being one of the better quarterbacks in the NFL. This year, I think it's going to still be a lot about growing. It's going to be about, a lot about you know building that chem- chemistry with the team. And something that uh, you know was brought up by uh, my colleague Jerry Dulac on the uh, on the North Shore Drive podcast yesterday that I think you should definitely go check out if you haven't already. But he brought up a very good point. Part of uh, year two of Kenny Pickett isn't just him adjusting to the, you know to being used to the NFL. It's also defenses adjusting to what he likes to do, and that's often the best quarterbacks are the guys that can kind of stay focused. You know, you know, rec- recognize that they have tendencies and then counter those tendencies when when defenses are trying to stop them. Um, I think that's something that Kenny Pickett did well in college too, because teams did start the game plan for him, and he would look ready and he would be. He would be solid in those moments. So I think Kenny Pickett right now, again, uh, if he continues to grow with his accuracy, I think that he's going to be that guy. And again, if you're if you're combining that with uh, the the raw abilities that he brought and the leadership qualities, he can be an elite quarterback. And again, some of these these back shoulder passes, they're deep down the field. They're not just in the at the line of scrimmage or in the backfield or just four yards beyond. We're talking 20, 30, 40 yard passes that he is throwing and hitting uh, with 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 accuracy. And he's not always accurate. There's times he misses and seven shots. In fact, he missed one that was pretty bad. But um, as far as how he's performing Overall, if you want to know, you know, where Kenny Pickett is I'm telling you right now, he's also in a good place for what for what he's been doing. So I think that that's uh, something that we'll keep continue to keep an eye on. And I think it's something that as we go through preseason, uh, I, I think that preseason is going to be a proving ground for Broderick Jones and Dan Moore Jr. And that might be what comes down to how they decide who starts at left tackle. But for Kenny Pickett, preseason is going to be about how comfortable do you feel in this offense what kind of uh, chain will they let? How long is the chain that they're going to let you loose on uh, to to be a playmaker and to be a quarterback and to be a leader? All those things we'll see when the games start getting played. In fact, the first game, the Hall of Fame game, I believe, is today. So that'll be awesome to know that that's underway. And then soon the Steelers will be getting at it um, in the in the preseason. But before we get to any of that, want to talk to we're going to talk a little bit more about the linebackers because I've talked a little bit about what we've seen, but I want to give some realism on what we've seen because some of it's very good. Some of it's not so very good. I want to. We'll, we'll talk about that in that group in just a minute here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host Chris Carter. Uh, be sure to uh, to to stick with us because we have a lot uh, of of other things coming coming your way here on the Locked On Steelers podcast where we will be uh, discussing. Uh, the linebackers. We're also going to try to get Jenna Horner on. I'll be. I'll be honest. It could be tough with just how uh, um, how how rough training camp schedule gets uh, for for us sometimes. But we'll try to get her on tomorrow. But before we do any of that, I want to talk to you guys about our great sponsors at Underdog Fantasy. Now, when it comes to Underdog Fantasy, this is a great opportunity chance to put money down and and see if you can win win in their in their games as well. August is here, and you know what that means. It's the official start of fantasy football drafting month. Get championship ready for your home league by trying out their their best ball on Underdog Fantasy. All you do is one live snake draft. That's no waivers, no trades. Underdog sets your best lineup every week. Try it out with Underdog's Best Ball Mania Tournament. The largest fantasy football contest of all time is back and even bigger with $15 million of total prizes up for grabs, including an absurd $3 million going to the winner. Last year, the winner drafted their team in July, so don't wait around. Go to Underdog Fantasy right now, and you can go to their website, underdogfantasy.com, or find them in the App Store and sign up with the promo code Locked On. That's L O C K E D O N, Locked On, all capital letters, all one word. And you'll get your first deposit doubled up to $100. That's Underdog Fantasy, promo code Locked On, Underdog Fantasy, promo code Locked On.
Back here on the Locked On Steelers podcast, I'm your host, Chris Carter. We continue talking about Steelers training camp here. Um, let's talk about the, the linebacker group. And I think there are now four legitimate guys here, adding Mark Robinson to the group, who we are looking at and wondering, can they turn things around at the linebacker position? Because that has been a source of struggle for the Steelers defense for the past few years. I think last year they were barely adequate you know miles jack kind of held it down devin bush had flashes here and there that, that made you think oh maybe he's back and then eventually as the year went on you saw that he wasn't back to where he was as a rookie but um as we know they flipped things around they signed cole holcomb he's kind of going to be their their every down guy and landon roberts is kind of the physical downhill guy quan alexander another physical downhill guy who can help a little bit in the passing game and then of course mark robinson who they kept around as a seventh round pick from last year who is all everything he is a downhill guy he is just bringing the mac truck hit every single time but um when it comes to uh, when it comes to how this group is playing so far, we've seen in the first day of pads, we kind of saw a chance for this group to prove themselves against the run, and they proved themselves. Cole Holcomb was up in there. Atlanta Roberts was crushing people. Mark Robinson was crushing people. Quan Alexander was flying all over the where. Jim Wexel brought up, uh, you know, called him a blur for how fast he was moving around the defense, uh, kind of trying to prove a point that, hey, he can be that guy in the middle of the defense that causes problems for opponents. And I think that that's what you want there. So it's a good, healthy competition right now. And I also say Mark Robinson has improved as well. Uh, but I also say Mark Robinson is still probably the least proficient in pass coverage and fitting in in the totality of the responsibilities at linebacker. But still, he's a second-year player from the seventh round as a pick. He's doing just fine for where he is. But it was interesting to see and hear how things reacted on uh, Wednesday when they kind of did a few more things with the linebackers. And that was when they went in coverage. Now, Cole Holcomb held down the fort, in my opinion, when it came to going up against Najee Harris. There's a bit of a back and forth there. And I think they're brewing a pretty good rivalry there as far as uh, covering, you know, you know, Holcomb covering uh, Najee Harris when the pass game is, is going on and how that's working. I think that they're in a very healthy place, a back and forth. Like I said, Najee had a good back shoulder deep ball and wheel route that he that he caught. Uh, Cole Holcomb's had a few breakups when he's covering Najee Harris. And if you're covering Najee Harris all around the field, that's a really good sign. It's also a sign that Matt Canada might be willing, more willing to throw to running backs all over the field. We'll see if that actually plays out in games. But the entire running uh, linebacker unit went up against Anthony McFarlane and got smoked on Wednesday. And good for Anthony McFarlane. He's been on the team for quite some time. He's been growing. He's been trying to get his opportunity. He's the speed back. It's good that he gets a chance to show his skills as a receiving back. And not every running back that they're going to face is like that. But it's a sign of how rough it can be for these linebackers if they're up against athletic uh, playmakers out of the backfield and also not out of the backfield when they're facing slot receivers who kind of run into their zone and they have to kind of just jump on them because that's just what the matchups dictate. It kind of also illustrated to me that there might be a bit of a struggle with this group if they're facing faster guys like that. And that's natural. You're going to have weaknesses, but the question will be how can the Steelers defense mitigate it? And I, I do think that there's still this is still going to be a better group this year. Um, I, again, I think that Holcomb is looking like a really good uh, every down back. I think that Alexander is moving around very well against the run. I think that he's finding his place there. And he just got here this week. He's still learning. Uh, so he's going to take time. And this group is better than the previous group was against the past. But the question is, will it be enough? But I think one thing to remember about this group when we're seeing them lose matchups in the past game and still try to adjust to a thing. One, everyone's brand new. But two, this isn't the group that needs to be the stars of the defense. Remember when I was, when I was, when I was making this point all, all, all offseason? This team, this defense is is needs to be elite for this team to be good, to be to, to, to be good. Like, uh, like there's no question about it. The offense for as excited as we are about, you know, Broderick Jones and being able to cover Kenny Pickett and all the other things that are going to happen here. And George Pickens is as excited as everyone wants to be about that. The defense is still going to need to be the, the part of the team that carries it. Now, there's going to be more games where the offense steps in and has an impact on it. And that's great. 
but this defense needs needs to be great to do it. But it doesn't need the linebackers to be the group that is great and that handles all the problems. They've got a, a defensive line that I think is going to be really good uh, to great. I think they're going to they could have the potential to be, have the best front in the NFL between Hayward, Ogunjobi, Watt, Highsmith, and we're even seeing a lot of promise out of Golden and, and Herbie. And also to Marvin Leal, who apparently tweaked his ankle, but though it's a considered a minor injury, so that's not a, that's that's not an issue. Oh, we we did get the official word about Corey Trice; he is out for the season. That stinks. Uh, and now with injuries as they're as they're mounting, I think Keanu Neal also suffered an injury. Devonte KZ is week to week in training camp right now with his injury, and Minka Fitzpatrick's been gone for personal reasons. Um, and uh, it's kind of leaving training camp getting a little bit thin here. Now the Steelers, they appreciate the chance to get more guys to look at, but you also, also kind of want to see how your units look when everyone's healthy at some point too. So that's going to be a big question. But this is still a team that's going to be led by Watt, Hayward, Fitzpatrick. I even think Patrick Peterson's going to going to fact, factor into this a lot. I think he's looked really good in training camp, uh, not just as a mentor for Joey Porter Jr., but as a player who's been asked to make some plays. I've seen him lock up, you know, Deontay Johnson, Pat Fryermuth, whoever he's lined up with, George Pickens. He looks just like the Patrick Peterson that you think he'd look like. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of excitement around what this team could be like, but the linebackers. I, if you're seeing them get smoked and you're wor- worrying about it, uh, listen, there's probably going to be games where that is a liability and that teams are going to be, p- be able to pick at it. But I don't think that that is going to be as crushing to the Steelers as it has been in years where I've talked about when John Bostick started to get exposed in the 2018 uh, de- defense. This is, a, this is a different defense that I think will allow these guys to kind of have more support so that they're not put in as tough situations. But even so... I think what they're being asked to do, stuff the run, help the middle part of the field in the pass game, and don't be a liability. I think that this group can do that and that they're going to get sharper. And then we're still going to see what becomes the pecking order here for the Steelers linebackers, because as much as um, as as much as everyone's excited about Quan Alexander being at it, I don't just automatically award him the top linebacker spot or even the number two linebacker spot. Landon Roberts, I, I think, is a solid a solid player. I think it could end up being Cole Holcomb and Quan Alexander as your one-two punch, but I wouldn't rule out Landon Roberts just yet. I think that he's shown a good bit of what it takes to be a veteran linebacker, um, and it's just going to come down to how everyone plays, uh, you know, in, in training camp, and then how things go in the preseason games. You know, who's able to stuff the run more consistently? Who's able to help? more in the past we you know what sets can they be more prepared for because you know part of the challenge is also like when you're taking on teams who can help more against tight ends who can jam somebody at the line of scrimmage linebacker is kind of like running back uh, uh you know for, uh, they're kind of like the running back of the defense in that they need the they need linebackers to be able to handle so many different jobs because they're running back you're not just running the ball you're potentially catching the ball you're also playing pass protection you're doing a whole bunch of different things there linebackers are similar you, you're not just stuffing the run you're not just uh you're not just covering uh in zone you might be asked to help chip against the tight end or run man against the tight end you also might be a blitzer there's a lot of different things to happen there i think that this group has it in spades to stuff the run and get after the quarterback when it comes to the the inside linebacker position or the off ball linebacker position. But the question will be how how can they who who best blends those skills with their ability to help in the passing game? I think that's something that we'll continue to see as time moves on here uh, at Steelers training camp. We got another practice Thursday, and then like I said, Friday night lights. That'll be a big practice. That if you all remember the T.J. Watt story, I always share about how uh, James Harrison pulled him aside and showed him moves. It was the Friday night practice where that happened. Not that that's going to happen for Broderick Jones or whoever in this in, in in this training camp, but it's something that uh, it's a it's a night where I think that guys have been through the gamut. Now they've put on the full pads once or twice already. They're ready for uh, and, and they're and now they, they're kind of coming back at it with like, okay, we all kind of know each other now. Let's see what we can show here in front of a big crowd in a night practice uh, the week before the first preseason game. So we'll keep you guys up to date with what happens there. Stay tuned here in the Lockdown Steelers podcast. We'll have a Friday episode. I'll try to get up a bonus episode this weekend. Just depends on how tired I am because sometimes this stuff wears on you with training camp and then also, of course, pit training camp is back, uh, which I'm 
covering for the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. So you can find me, Chris Carter, on Twitter and Instagram at Carter Critiques. You can find all stuff about Pitt's training camp and football team getting started up here at the Post Pittsburgh Post Gazette, post gazettecom for all that coverage. And you can find me here on the Locked On Steelers podcast Monday through Friday, talking about your Pittsburgh Steelers right here on on your podcast, on your favorite podcasting apps, and on YouTube. Like this video if you enjoyed. Subscribe to this YouTube channel to get all of your daily Monday through Friday episodes. Thanks again for everyone for tuning in. Back Friday, finishing out the week right here on the Locked On Steelers podcast.